Welcome. I'm Chris Buckingham, your MC for today's webinar entitled, Getting Your Organization Aligned Around Value. With us today, we have Dr. Tom Nagel from Monitor's Strategic Pricing Group and Ed Arnold from Leverage Point. This webinar is an offering from the Professional Pricing Society and its ongoing effort to support pricing professionals and decision makers. PPS does this to bring you the best in pricing thought leadership, technology, and resources. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. The attendee phones are muted, so the presentation will not be disturbed by background noise. If you want to ask a question during the presentation, you can type it in the question box in the lower part of the panel on the right-hand side of your screen, then press the send button. I will ask your questions to the presenter at the conclusion of the presentation. In the event of a power outage, phone system problem, computer failure, or network issue, we will communicate alternative plans as quickly as possible. And finally, you will receive copies of the slides via email within 48 hours. Now it's time to get started. Today's webinar title is Getting Your Organization Aligned Around Value. Today's presenters are Dr. Tom Nagel and Ed Arnold. Dr. Tom Nagel is a partner at Monitor and founder of the Strategic Pricing Group, Monitor's company focused on pricing and value capture strategies. Dr. Nagel is a former professor of marketing and strategy at the University of Chicago and Boston University and a frequent keynote speaker at various professional conferences, including the keynote speaker at the upcoming PPS Spring Conference, May 5th through the 7th in Chicago. Dr. Nagel is the author of the best-selling book, The Strategy and Tactics of Pricing, just released in its fifth English edition. Ed Arnold is Director of Products at LeveragePoint, a software-as-a-service business partly owned by the Monitor Group. Previously, Mr. Arnold held senior positions at advisory services and software firms, including Monitor, Diamond Management and Technology, and Communispace. Mr. Arnold has an MBA from New York University and a BA and MA degrees from Boston University. Now that you know about our presenters, I will turn the presentation over to Ed Arnold. Ed, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris, and greetings to everyone who's watching our webinar today. Tom and I are very excited to be here. Let me give you a quick overview of our agenda. There are three topics that we'll cover. The first thing we'll talk about, what is a value-based strategy? Then we'll decide, describe major challenges in implementing one. And finally, we'll share a case study example about a successful implementation that we worked with. At this time, we want to ask our viewers about their experiences with value-based strategy. So we have a polling question open. Chris? And the question is, which of the following have you used to implement a value-based pricing strategy? Is it A, value-based sales training for Salesforce, for Salesforce, B, pricing and value management training for managers, marketers, C, spreadsheet-based value models, D, conjoint analysis with customers, and or E, fair value line calculations. Now, you can choose multiple uh, choices uh, in, in the polling, and we'll wait a few We'll wait a few minutes while the results are being tabulated. So, uh, Tom, I know that you're quite familiar with uh, many of these approaches. Uh, any comments? Uh, yeah, at, at the risk of discouraging people from, from picking one or the other, um, note that you can pick multiple ones. Uh, you know, they're, they're, I, I find very often that, that when companies are attempting to go to a more value-based approach, they pick one of these and drive ahead with it. Um, Probably the first one most common is is we got to get our sales force all selling on value, uh, but but often the results are disappointing because uh, a the salespeople don't um, all have the skills to to actually create value models, and b it's a huge investment on their uh, on, on their part a huge investment of time, so um, they, you know they're not willing to do that. Uh, even if you even if you do the have have marketers developing these, but you just train marketers to do it and then say, okay, go do it. What happens is 
every value model that the company creates is created with different terminology. It looks different. It runs different. It feels different. So now the sales rep keeps saying, sales rep, every time they, they get a new one, they have to learn something new, and, they, and, it, and it, it, it can be very confusing. Um, and then there are people who get drawn into conjoint or fair value calculation, things like that. Which, which don't really have anything to do with customer value. They have to do with willingness to pay. And, and that's quite different. Reacting to willingness to pay is very different than proactively trying to influence what customers are willing to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's, uh, Chris, do we have the results? Um, yeah, and uh, as I look at these, um, so, so, so two thirds of the group has actually done um, spreadsheet-based value models. So, you, so you'll have a, some, a sense of what the kind of thing we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, and, and, and almost half have actually had sales training to help people sell value. So, 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 that's, so that's a good start. Um, let me just quickly review, and for those um, who haven't worked with um, value models before, perhaps um, introduce the whole concept of value management and how it relates to pricing strategy. So first is, what is customer value? Uh, you know, many companies start out, when I, when I criticize the idea of the conjoint and the, um, and the fair value line, many companies start out at the level of features. And it's, so they're asking the question, OK, what's this feature worth? What's that feature worth? What's that feature worth? without getting to, to, to why the customer would, um, um, would, would put that value on the feature. And often what you find is that people put value on features just because, they, you know, for, for reasons that have nothing to do with the real benefits that they're getting. And uh, uh, because they don't really totally understand the benefits. So, so, so they're using something else. The whole idea of value management is to manage people's perceptions of value by understanding the benefits that they get from your product and service and quantifying them. So to do that, you have to go beyond, OK, what is it that we offer and what's that worth, to asking, why should the customer care about the things we're offering? And then the next thing is, given why they care, is it adding to productivity? Is it reducing turnover? Is it driving more revenue, share, whatever it is? What's it worth to them? To, um, to, to, to get that incremental amount of productivity, to get that incremental amount of share. So that's the basic model of, 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 um, of value management. Now, how does that relate to value-based pricing? Well, the more value we can communicate to customers, the higher we can price. So, so pricing is basically a balancing of the, the value that we have, the value that customers perceive and the, and the, price, and the um, price we're going to charge them. And the value has to be greater than the price to induce them to buy. But um, uh, the whole idea of the value management is to the extent that we can increase that left side, the value they perceive, by, by identifying the benefits better for them, by quantifying them, by guaranteeing them, then, 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 then the more we can get on the right side in terms of, of initial purchase price, maintenance fees, um, an ancillary costs, whatever, whatever those, whatever those um, charges happen to be. And we can also identify where there's a need for differences in pricing across segments to reflect the fact that, that, that they're getting different levels of value um, um, because they have different value drivers. So, how do we go about actually doing that? Um, I'm, I'm always surprised about the number of people who have rejected value-based pricing because they say, oh, we tried that, but it doesn't work because if our competitors aren't pricing that way, then, then, then we can't do it because customers aren't going to pay the value of something if somebody's going to sell it to them for less. Of course not. We're not taught you can't charge people the use value of what you sell. You can only charge up to the economic value. And economic value is, is defined by two things. First, it's defined by the next best competitive alternative. Every aspect of your product, every benefit that your product produces that's no different than what a competitor's product will produce can't be charged more for. Um, you, know, you, you can only charge for the, for the commodity aspects of your product the price that the market has set for it. That's your competitive reference value. 
the whole value, the, the whole um, reason for value-based management is, is when you are having, when you have a product or service to offer that is in some way differentiated and you want to capture that value in your price. And that's the positive differentiation value. And the positive differentiation value is just what, what does your product do, what, what, what features of your product exist that, that are better than or different than the competitive reference product, and then we have to figure out what the benefits are associated with those and impute a value to them that, that, that we can credibly communicate to customers. Now, it's possible that you'll have some negative differentiation value as well. Um, for example, if the, ex if the product that they're using now they already know how to use, but your product needs training, well, the training is going to be costly to the customers, so you have to have some reduction. But the idea here is to establish an economic value so that later when you go to set a price, your price, rather than having to, to um, argue for the price premium in excess of competition, you can make the case that no, your product is actually a, a discounted relative to value. Okay. So with after that very, very quick review, um, now the question is who's responsible for making this happen, for converting features to benefits, benefits to value, and positioning the price relative to that value? Is it product development, marketing, market communication, sales, or finance? Um, so quickly take your vote on where you think, and again, you can have multiple answers here. Uh, please, oh, no, I'm, 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 we're only allowing one answer on this one. Okay, all right. So, so, so select one, um, which was actually um, very unfair to you. <laughs> because the simple fact is, of course, um, uh, if, you try to, if you do just one, this is probably not going to work. Um, successful value-based um, pricing depend, depends on a, a um, coordination of the product development so that you're offering each segment good value, the brand management who's identifying what those um, benefits are and, and helping to quantify them, the market communication that creates the messages in the sales force that delivers them. And, and that all needs to be coordinated. And it's very often the lack of coordinate, the failure of coordination that leads to the failure of the, of the value-based strategy. And, uh, and, oh, interestingly, okay. And, and, and probably if I had to pick one, I would say, it's marketing that should really be driving this. You can't ask the sales organization to drive this unless the sales organization is, consists of people who are you know, do, doing one, uh, you know, one huge sale a month and they can spend a whole lot of time building the model um, for each individual customer application. But in general, it makes a lot more sense for marketing to drive the development of these um, um, for, the, for, the, for the purpose of um, uh, uh, doing it for everyone so, so that you are not having, you're not having different people um, um, developing the models, but, but they're developing them but it still needs to be coordinated within the product development, the market communications, and the sales. Um, so that's basically the four organizations that we're talking about. And the challenge that, that companies face in each one of them is product development, they're often technical people, they're engineers, and they, realize, they see all kinds of value-added features, services they can add to the product, but Sometimes, if, and if I can think of a lot of companies that have, that have been historically, you know, experts at this. Um, Philips was, was, was one of the companies. Leader in developing new technologies, you know, the, 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 the next great sound technology, the next great video thing. But they always overbuilt the products so that they'd add more things to it than people were willing to pay for. And then somebody else would come out and figure out, well, what's the product that represents not the best product but the best value? Um, marketing managers are often insulated from the customers. All they know about the customers are the things that they're getting from surveys, like the conjoint. So, so, so they, they know what customers are willing to pay, but they, know, they, they don't have the information about what are the, really the drivers and barriers 
um, underlying to customer choice, and what are those what are what are those um, um, worth? How, how do our, can our products, features, and services influence those drivers and barriers? The market communications people are often communicating messages about the product, about what it does, but not about the value it produces because they don't have the necessary information. Now the salespeople are standing right in front of the customer. They're getting back the feedback about what the problems are that the customer is facing. Not the kind of survey feedback, but, but really the kind of, kind of rich information that you need, but they rarely have the expertise um, to, be building, to be building value models, let alone going back and having those value models feed back into the product development process. Um, there is, of course, um, you know, the whole idea of the price management software out there, Vendavo Pros and the like, is to coordinate pricing policies and analytics across this group. But, but those softwares don't, do, not have the, do not help um, develop the ability to identify, quantify, and sell value. They do, they're not like, capturing the value drivers. They're, they're, they have opposite, the other direction. OK, once we understand that, what's the price that we're going to put out there? So that's the challenge people are facing in implementing this. And that's the challenge that we, we're going to um, um, talk to you about how we're, we've helped companies address here in, um, here in the remainder of the seminar. Ed? OK, uh, thanks, Tom. So we're going to show a, a case study, an actual case study uh, based on a company that we've recently worked with who has dealt with these issues uh, using a software platform capability. So first, a little background. Uh, this is a company in the construction products business. Uh, it sells to both commercial and residential markets. It understands that the key to its survival is to produce highly differentiated products and to capture uh, the maximum value for that differentiation. So we're going to take a look at how they've implemented this uh, using a very specific product. Uh, and this is a new waterproofing product that's used in the construction uh, business. So we'll use this to illustrate uh, some of the issues that, that Tom has identified. All right, so we're going to be illustrating uh, this case study uh, using uh, an online tool. Uh, this is uh, what's called Leverage Point for Value Management. It's a SaaS-based solution, and it helps marketing and salespeople collaborate around value management. So what you're looking at here is a completed uh, value model that a product development manager um, has put together for this waterproofing product. And, and, and you know, we, we deliberately picked this one for a number of reasons. One is there were a lot of different uh, differentiating features, and more importantly, how those features then mapped into um, the, the, the contractor's um, construction project and, and had an, an impact on that project, positive or negative, um, was, was, was relatively complex. So, so prior to having a model like this, there was a tendency to, um, uh, to go and just talk about features to people who had not um, previously um, used it and who were reluctant to make changes from what works. So, so, so um, being able to quantify the value in this particular way, in, in a very visual way, um, and make all that complexity, simplify all of that complexity was very, was, was very important. And when, when we did it, uh, even, even the company and the sales organization were quite surprised to see how much differentiation value there was relative to the competitive alternative waterproofing that, they, that was being used at present. Right. So um, by the way, this is a disguised example. We've taken out specific product names and, and changed some of the data here. Uh, but a couple of things to point out here that, first of all, this is the offering and a value model for a particular customer, in this case, the, the building owner. And what you see here is a differentiation value area of over $10. And you'll notice that there are a number of these green positive value drivers that contribute to that differentiation value. Let's take a look at a couple of them in detail. So for every value driver that's in this model, uh, there is a calculation based on a formula. And in this particular case, it's around a defect costs. And you'll see the customer's current defect costs, 
the percent change of the waterproofing solution, and it calculates the estimated uh, economic value for in this particular application. On the bottom here, you'll see a notes that shows the, the hypotheses or the assumptions that the product development manager is used to put these together. Uh, this enables other people to look at this analysis and to change it or at least to know and document what, what assumptions were made in, in terms of the value. These, of course, can be, uh, these can be modified in, in, in real time. And uh, I will change the value here. So you can, you can see the, the impact of that in terms of the differentiated value. Another thing that can be done is to do some what-if modeling. Uh, so, for example, if we were to take out these two key value drivers, you'll notice very, very quickly that the differentiation value uh, drops significantly. And that, that becomes very useful in the product development process. It also come, becomes useful when deciding and when thinking about what are the different packages that you want to offer to different segments, because each segment will have its own EVE, and then you say, okay, this is a more price-sensitive segment, but that segment isn't getting, it's the reason is they aren't getting as much value from a, um, a particular benefit, so let's click that benefit out and see what an offering to them would be, um, be, be um, look like in terms of value um, um, relative, to, relative to the offering of other segments. Right. Now, one of the decisions that a product development manager needs to make is to figure out which features are adding the most economic value to the particular offering. And one way to look at it is to, to, to map those. So here we see a detailed features to, to benefit mapping. Um, and what that does is it shows uh, the, the one-to-many relationships between features and benefits so to take a very, very uh, specific example, there's a feature in this waterproof proofing product uh, around capabilities uh, specifically for shot creep, which is a, a form of concrete in the construction business. Notice that there are a number of these benefits that relate to uh, this particular feature. And in turn, as we go through the model, you'll see that they support economic value drivers and create differentiation value. Now, early in the development process, uh, there were a number of other features that were considered for this product, but because they either could not be proven to show value, uh, it allowed them, uh, you know, our client to make some uh, decisions about what to focus on in terms of the product. Another thing that a product development manager needs to do is to figure out what the economic uh, impacts are of particular uh, features uh, features and benefits. Uh, the way uh, this is accomplished is having access to a value driver library. What we have here is a list of all the possible economic impacts that a feature and benefit can have on a customer's business model. And they have them in all the, the various categories. Costs, which are very, very common. Uh, revenues, which are often less commonly seen in, in value models and then more subtle ones related to assets, either working capital or capital expenditures. Now, now the important thing here is, is the, the, you know, the software has these generic categories, um, and um, uh, so, 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 that, so that certain things aren't missed. One of the, um, one of the, one of the um, um, benefits of the software is when a particular um, um, product manager actually for a, for a particular segment of customers creates a formula um, to convert um, uh, things that are the, the revenues and costs in that industry into a value for a benefit, then that becomes part of the library. And, and a future product manager can then draw on that, on that particular formula. So, 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 you get, so this library gets richer over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we're going to move on to um, the value, communi value communications part uh, of the tool. Uh, and this is what marketing communications uh, managers will be uh, working with. So once a, and, and by the way, a lot of uh, companies use the value modeling as a, as a gate in product development processes. Um, once the, a product, like for example, in this case, the waterproofing product, 
once it passed through that, that, that value model validation phase, uh, then, then the next task is to put together the go-to-market strategy around that. Um, and that involves a, a number of activities, uh, structuring the pricing, developing the marketing collateral, and also uh, the sales tool. So what we're looking at here is a, a value communications tool uh, used primarily by marketing communications managers. And what you'll notice here is that the general overall value proposition uh, is provided. Uh, this is information that they're uh, writing anyway. And what, what they're doing basically is taking their work and linking it to this overall value model. The other thing that they're doing is they're taking each of the value drivers, which is a pretty much technical term, and putting it into the customer's language. It's basically translating the jargon out of the EVE analysis and making it customer friendly. So you'll know that every, so you'll see that every value driver has a value message and it's linked to specific customer pain points. Another important part of the go-to-market planning activity is setting the price and creating the justification for that price. Yeah, and, and Ed, uh, the, the important thing to note is, you know, EV value communication um, um, and, and value quantification, uh, you know, doesn't tell you what to price. What it tells you is, is it, it gives you a case for pricing higher, <laughs> okay? But now that your, your ability to capture that depends on two things. One is how strong is the case? Uh, you know, we do a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies, and and you know, you see this miraculous thing that if they go to payers and they say, we will guarantee the results that we showed you on the EVE, or or we will uh, or we will refund money to you if you don't um, reduce hospital costs by a certain amount, if you don't reduce the number of heart attacks by a certain amount, the ability to capture a very high percentage of that value goes way up. In fact, from an economic standpoint, in, in pharmaceuticals, you can capture 100% of it because, because there's the benefits to the patient that they're concerned about, so long as, it, so long as the product will, will pay for itself from an economic standpoint. Um, uh, and in other cases, you're in a situation where you have this high economic value, but you won't choose to capture it all because perhaps there's another competitor coming in in two years. Now, you need this value um, story because you want to because you want to be able to frame that even though this product is priced at a premium compared to what's out there now, it's still a huge bargain relative to the value, and that's the reason why you should commit to our product quickly before the competitive product gets there. So there's a whole lot of other elements of strategy other than the value, but the value is your anchor in setting that pricing. Right. And what we found is that it's really important to see what the impact of price has on splitting the differentiation value between the, the customer and the, and the supplier. So what we have here is a, a pricing meter. And as that changes, you'll notice that obviously the, the price uh, goes up, but the split between the value add to customer versus the value add to us, that is the, the value that is captured, uh, does change at different different at different levels at different price levels. So getting back to this uh, waterproofing case here, um, the price that was set for this particular product uh, was at, at about uh, nine seventy five. Now that's that's a premium compared to the competitive product uh, by over two dollars. Uh, but that price is justified to the customer by showing that the product provides twice as much value than the competitive product. And these discussions happen all the time, but be, being able to, to visualize that and to discuss it collaboratively, uh, we, we found in practice to be extremely important to align uh, marketing and sales groups uh, together. So doing so gave uh, our client much more confidence in introducing a new product in a very tough uh, economic climate. All right. 
So once, once price setting and the value story and the value messages are prepared, uh, the marketing communications manager then has to make a decision about whether or not to publish. Uh, and publish is basically uh, a function that, that says that this value model is available to be used in the sales situation. So you'll notice here that this, this has already been published and, uh, and that this can be used to, again, develop either sales guides or marketing communications uh, tool. Uh, so let's take a look at what this looks like from the sales perspective. The design of this is different than what you've seen in the tool and, and, and it was purposely so. Uh, the needs of salespeople, the feedback that we, that we receive from salespeople is that you have to summarize this information. Summarize it in a, on a one-page format that's easy to read and that is customer friendly. So you'll notice that the bar chart here um, is only showing the essential information that's important in the sales discussion. That is the additional value that the product provides relative to the competition. But you'll notice that all the other pieces uh, from the value communications and the value model uh, are shown here. Uh, the overall description, uh, the differentiators, uh, as well as each of the, uh, as each of the value messages, uh, the pain points, and then for each of the calculations, they're just available uh, one click away. And what, what this particular page um, um, doesn't illustrate but is particularly important at this, at this stage is that you know, we, we and, and for the beta company that, um, that for, for which this was developed, um, they actually had been developing um, EVE models for quite some time in um, um, Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. But the problem that the, that the salespeople complained is Every time one of these comes out, the terminology is different, the visuals are different, the formulas are different, and, and so, you know, how many of these things do you expect me to learn? How many of these things do you expect me to understand and, and not get confused when I'm going across from one to the other? So, 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 so the salespeople weren't embracing it. The, the, um, as, as all of those models were put in the software, what, what happened was the visual then became the same, where a sales rep found the information was the same, so that when they looked, looked for something for an entirely new product, it came to them and nothing looked foreign. They recognized the terminology, they recognized the visual, and the like. Mm -hmm. So sales users have their own interface into the software platform, and from there they access the company's entire online catalog of value models that have been created for them. Now currently, our, this client is, is using this capability in pre-sales pre calling activities. Uh, and in a recent test uh, with this particular product, this waterproofing product, uh, eight out of 10 salespeople reported it, reported it as being very useful in preparing for their uh, sales calls. Now, the other thing that salespeople can do is they can customize these value models for specific customer accounts. So let me show you how that works. So we're going back to the main page here and there's a tab called Feedback from Sales. And in our example here, again, we've disguised this for our purposes today. Uh, you'll notice that there is one uh, copy which is referred to as a derivative for a particular account. So this is the main model that we've, we've been showing throughout. And in this case, a sales user has created uh, or customized this particular model for their account, which is Acme Holdings. So let's take a look at what they've done. The marketer can tell exactly what changes that the sales 
person has made. So you'll notice that the name has changed. It's been outlined in a different color. Uh, you'll also notice that there are notes that the salesperson has added. Um, and here they're, they're noting that they changed the customer data from $5 to 485 which in turn has updated the model, making it more relevant. Um, you'll also see that they've added volume for the particular customer, so they understand what the annual impact of this, uh, this product could have on their projects. And they've added a note with that as well. You know, marketers always want to be on the sales calls. Um, but they can't for, for a lot of reasons. And basically what this allows them to do is to be uh, participants in sales calls virtually. After salespeople have made their notes and made their changes, and the reason they do that is because they want to. It's, it's part of what they need to do to, um, to prepare for a customer conversation. Marketing can get uh, that real-time uh, field intelligence. In addition, there's a feedback section here where the salesperson can provide explicit feedback back to marketing. Uh, they can rate the packages uh, in a star rating, much like you would see in the Amazon uh, book rating. And they can add some specific comments. Marketers can reply to that, and they could actually have a dialogue there. And these reviews are available to the marketers. It's also available to other salespeople, so they can share best practices. So what we've done here essentially is uh, closed the, the, the feedback loop between the marketing organization and sales while supporting value-based selling. Okay. So what have um, I know what 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 happened here, and what what um, our challenge was when when, when asked by this um, uh, the client to help them was that that you know they they were an organization with many products um, coming out the sa the same sales organization sold those many different products, and they just they they were committed to creating great value. But, but they somehow, it was breaking down by the time it got to the customers who were, who were and, and, the, and the interface between the sales organization and the customer. And what the software enabled them to do is three things. First, it enabled them to create some, some very consistent communication from, from marketing, between product development and marketing, and marketing and market communications in terms of terminology, in terms of technology, and in terms of basic philosophy. And so, so that the things that they were doing were now coordinated. Um, it also enabled them to get, um, at, at, over time, to build, a, um, build an organizational capacity, the, or a capability. Because as um, each time they, di they went through a product with, with marketing, marketing communications and product development, developing a value proposition, all of the, all of the um, quantification that they did, all of the de identification of value drivers, now became something that other marketing teams could access. And then the consistency of all of the things that came from each marketing team to sales enabled sales to now access that information a whole lot easier because once they learned how to access it for one product, they knew how to access it for all the products. But the final thing being that sales now had, sales who have are really much better sources and much richer sources of, of customer information than, than, than any survey you can do um, because, because rather than it being closed end and things like that, they're in a conversation with the customers. And so when it comes to value, by, by the, the edits that they make to the model, they're able to communicate back to product, 
to, to product development, marketing, and market communications and say, you know, you thought that this, this value driver was particularly important, but it wasn't. This other value driver over here is highly important. We have a small impact here, but if we really wanted to drive that segment, this, is, this would be the one that would really, would, would really have a big impact. So, so they're now starting to feel more ownership of the value communication model mm -hmm. as, it, as, it, as it gets a, a um, or as, as the EVE models, as they become, as they begin to reflect the feedback from the sales organization. So, I mean, in summary, this is an example of having uh, an organizational-wide capability linking various different groups together around a value management initiative. Uh, I think software as a service is in a unique position uh, to, to connect people, to uh, establish consistency, uh, and be able to do that with a, with a, with a relatively uh, easy cost and burden on a company's uh, traditional IT infrastructure. So uh, our point of view is that, that solutions such as this are, are really a great way to embed value management capability in an organization. Chris? Tom, Ed, thank you very much for your informative talk. A few questions came in during your presentation. And while asking them, I will be putting up poll slides for the attendees to fill out. This helps the Professional Pricing Society evaluate the success of these events and provides feedback to the presenter. Please answer the poll questions as they appear. I also want to remind the attendees that copies of the slides will be delivered via email within 48 hours. Also, to keep you abreast of current topics, practices, and technologies in the pricing area, the Professional Pricing Society conducts webinars on a regular basis. Watch for upcoming webinars at PricingSociety.com. And it's not too early to start planning for the Professional Pricing Society workshops and conferences. Visit PricingSociety.com for more information. Now for the questions that came in during the presentation. How long has this tool been available to customers, and what's been their experience? Uh, I'll take that one, Chris. So uh, the tool's been available. The, the core functionality of the tool has been available available for about a year and a half. Uh, we have about a half dozen companies that are, are using it right now, and I think we've had a number of success stories. I think in the product development uh, side of things, it's been it's been very useful into prioritizing and designing products. Uh, we've also had some success stories in getting marketing communications more uh, efficient. And we, we, just we just recently introduced the, the sales piece of it, so it's, it's undergoing, it's in early days of trials right now. But I think, if nothing else, it, it's been uh, tremendously valuable in getting marketing and sales uh, on, the same, on the same page. And I've had, the, I've had the opportunity to sit in on those types of discussions, uh, and sometimes they can be quite heated, as you can imagine. And afterwards, I spoke uh, to, to my client about it, and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, it's the first time they've really had an a in-depth discussion around value. So I think in, in terms of getting folks aligned, um, it, it has a lot of, a lot of dividends, and, and we're expecting it to, to show some progress in advancing sales as well. Can you comment about the appropriate blending of marketing messaging around brand versus value message? How directly should you market your value message? Ah, that I think that's particularly important, and I, I you know, and I think it really depends on 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 what the nature of your um, of, of what the nature of your brand value is. Um, you know, this, this is not the answer for all products. Um, uh, there are products for which the brand value is, is actually because of what it represents um, um, in, terms of, in terms of the benefits that the brand delivers. So, you know, the, the, the IBM brand value has a meaning to it. The Apple brand value has a meaning to it in terms of, in terms of, in terms of what, you, what you expect. Um, you know the Apple um, high ease of use is, is part of it. Is the um, you know the, the, the IBM very very high reliability, uh, and uh, in in the case of in the case of this this particular um, client, 
of, of ours, it, it was, it was um, uh, you know, that, 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 that very, innovative, um, very innovative chemical products. Um, and so, so if they came out with a product, you expected that it would work. So, so there was something associated about the product that gave the brand value, a, a level of trust. There are other brand, there are other aspects of brand that 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 really are not aligned with the with the functionality, but they're but they're more they're more associated with um, with 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 things like image, mm -hmm. and uh, you know this that that is a very important value, but it's not particularly relevant. You know, it, it 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 certainly wouldn't be relevant for this kind of approach. How do you compensate for the tendency of sales to communicate the worst feedback, usually that we are way too overpriced when showing a transactional sale based on, say, a liquidation? Yeah. Well, you know, you 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 have to accept that. Um, um, uh, you know, most salespeople are doing two things. They're trying to sell the customer and they're trying to sell their company. <laughs> in order to, you know, they're brokers. They don't really work for you. They work independently. But the, um, you know, I think that's also an indication very often of a sales organization that is, that is um, um, uh, not being a, a, a appropriately compensated in the sense that their compensation is entirely driven by top line. And if their compensation and their performance measurement, even if not the compensation, is entirely driven by top line, then of course the way to drive that top line is to give us more flexibility to discount. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, uh, but, but it's very interesting how you'll get a change in, um, in that mindset if suddenly you know they discount the price, then take away half the margin, and you know what, their compensation goes down by half. But if they get a, um, but if they if they can raise the price by five percent, and that increases their the margin by twenty five percent, then they get twenty five percent more credit for the sale. And you know it's it's very interesting to see how how the feedback that comes back, instead of it all being about how we're overpriced, suddenly becomes, why can't we do this for the customer? Why can't you know, if you want to start getting this feedback about what's important to the customers, start paying people more when they can sell at a premium, and they'll start letting you know what they need to sell at a premium. How do you recommend using this approach if the ownership of the end customer is with the distributor and the economic value for the distributor is different than that of the customer. Yes, <clears throat> we've uh, we've run into that situation, and it, it's very simple. It, it, it's not just one value model; it's a series of value models. So, with this particular client that we used the example for, they had a they had a consumer product that was sold into big box stores. So essentially, uh, there were a series of EVEs that were created, one uh, for the value between them and their distributors, another for distributors to the big box stores, and actually we, we developed some for the uh, actual consumer. Uh, and there, the, the decision was between uh, doing it yourself versus uh, hiring a, a, a subcontractor. So the economics of that was uh, more straightforward than you usually get in a consumer product. So the answer is, you know, that that's a great way to apply value modeling because you do need to look at the the, the changes of value uh, across different business models. Uh, for a uh, for a big box store, re you're talking retail, you're talking about inventory turns, you're talking about margins, those types of things. Those are totally different economics. For an end Store, um, draw, yeah. you know, is it is it a product that people will um, will come to the location in order to be able to get it, or or or, or not go to the um, to, to the Walmart, but go to the go to another store, right. and thus Walmart gets gets misses one shopping because because they've gone there to get it. So so that's another big value driver when you're talking about big box stores. We've seen a similar situation with high tech companies and value added uh, resellers, same sorts of things or they're adding, uh, they're, they're taking the core product, they're bundling services around that, and even at different levels, you know, gold level, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very useful for modeling the, that type of flow of value. 
Uh, talk for a minute about complex technology products with a, with a lot of different features. Uh, does this tool work in that scenario? Yeah, because the idea is, you know, you've got a lot of different features, but let's get the different features down into probably a few value drivers. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, um, so, so that, um, uh, you know, again, that, then rather than selling, okay, it has this feature, this feature, and this feature, you, you basically say, you know, this package of features adds this much to productivity. It adds this much to reliability. It adds it. So, so you don't have to talk about the technology so much as, as, as talking and, and educate the customer all about the technology in order to be able to convince them of the, um, of, of, of that you're worth a premium. You're talking in terms of a, of, of, of a, sm of a smaller number of benefits that they actually completely understand already. Yeah, recently we were working with uh, an enterprise software company with a new product that had lots of features. And the mapping really helped because you had a whole lot of features that were driving pretty much the same benefit. So if you were, if you were justifying a feature on productivity, uh, very soon you were double counting or quadruple counting, and you had a 120% uh, efficiency gain, which was not very realistic. Uh, the thought process of, of, of having a way of filtering that out and sorting that out is extremely uh, is extremely important. I think being able to get it into a visual model allows you to take out the the undue complexity uh, is a great way to, to to put it in an understanding value. We have a, a few questions here on um, price and whether or not you can try the product. Can you comment generally on price points and whether or not you have a trial program? We do have a trial program, and uh, information on that is on our website, which is on the slide there, the leveragepoint.com. There's also some pricing information there as well. And uh, and unlike the publisher of my book, who, who uh, never um, has, has consulted with me about pr how to price the product, <laughs> LeveragePoint, who the, the, the publisher of the software based on it, did and it and it, and, it, and it's 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 value based. It's designed to be very um, um, you know very cost effective to um, uh, to get started to try it to use it to have to have marketing use it um, because we believe that it'll become addictive that uh, the sales organization that that salespeople will want to use it and then and then you know the 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 the, the license for each salesperson is is, 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 is the reward, but it's 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 a fairly it's a it's a um, relative to to software used in in pricing. It's 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 um, very the, the cost is very low to try it. We're close to the end of our time, so I'd like to thank Dr. Nagel and Ed Arnold for their presentation, and the attendees for taking time out of their busy day. If the attendees want more information, feel free to follow up with Tom or Ed directly. Contact information is listed on the final slide of the presentation, which the live attendees will receive in the next 48 hours. Finally, I'd like to remind the attendees to visit PricingSociety.com to register for future webinars and upcoming pricing conferences.